Okay. So um, the last presentation is uh, entitled uh, OpenSys Implementation of a 3D Embedded File Element for the Analysis of uh, Bridge Systems. And um, so it's um, by me, at University of Washington. Uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the collaborators. There are several uh, that have been working with, on this topic for several years. Uh, Chris McGam, uh, Catherine Petek, Long Cheng, and then, but most of the work has been done by uh, Albor Scofrani. And nowadays, uh, I have I am collaborating with people from Italy, uh, Domenico Galese, and Amin Pakas is joining UDAP. So the motive, uh, and of course the sponsors, uh, Pierre and Washington State DOT have also been uh, providing funds over the years to this type. Of so the motivation, the motivation is that um, when we are trying to analyze a bridge that this may be subject to a lateral spreading effects, uh, and we are trying to calculate how much are the loads that has must be used for the, um, for the design of these uh, structural elements. Um, we find that the bridge response is very much affected by 3D uh, geometric conditions and very complex uh, soil structure interactions. And there are many cases that show this problem. Ja I just want to show one case from the Jacolén Bridge in, from, in Chile uh, that was subject to uh, lateral spreading effects after the Maule uh, earthquake. And, um, and because of this, um, this lateral spreading, what happened uh, is there was liquefaction of a layer of soil that moved toward the, the riverbed, and we had the collapse of one uh, of the spans. The problem is when you start looking at this uh, foundation system, you start realizing that it's made of many elements that may not be all aligned, some of them may be line that is a sloping ground so you have a quite a complex a quite a complex foundation to analyze uh, and to, to uh, design properly so we go to models to try to design this thing and uh, when you start looking at what is needed for a model well what you realize that you need many things um, so you require advanced numerical systems or, or frameworks to do this analysis. Uh, today, I just want to concentrate on one aspect of this numerical aspect, which is the soil foundation interaction, because it's related to what we are proposing now uh, in, this, in this work that we are doing for people. So we have been looking at the pile soil interaction for many, many, many years. And when we go to uh, 3D, uh, 3D uh, domains, uh, we usually can model the soil using solid elements. We can also model the pile using solid elements. And we try to include also some, in some way, the interaction between these two domains using interface elements or maybe sometimes rigid links in order to accomplish a, and to find how, how is the interaction. Uh, another way to do that is to take advantage of beam elements. Beam elements are much better than solid elements to capture the response of the structural element themselves. They provide us bending moments, shear demands. We can use uh, fiber elements together with nonlinear uh, behavior for the steel and the concrete. And so it's much better to use beam elements. But in any case, in both cases, uh, there are meshes, uh, meshing challenges, in particular for the soil surrounding, uh, surrounding the pile. For one pile, it's not a big deal, but imagine that you have a complex domain with several piles, pile groups, then the meshing becomes a problem. So that's why we are trying to propose this idea of an embedded element. So imagine that you have a regular mesh that is easy to mesh, very regular system. And then we have the beam elements that we want to use. The idea is to embed these beam elements into this regular mesh. The problem is that the beam elements, they don't have this surface, interface surface that represents the interaction between the pile and the soil. So the idea is how to include now that interface that belongs to the pile and assign to this interface the interaction condition. And that's the embedded element that we are interested 
So very, very quickly, trying to go to how, how do we do this? Imagine that you have a soil domain where you can define any point. Then you have the pile domain where you have a pile points. For both elements at the interface, you can define surface. So you have the surface of the soil at the interface and you have the surface of the pile at the interface there. Now, when we are trying to use beam elements, that complicates a little bit th the things because that surface becomes an imaginary surface that doesn't exist physically in your model. So now we have to map points from the beam elements to that imaginary surface that may be outside there at a certain radius or for a certain. So what we do is to impose the uh, impenetrability or the, bounded, the, the constraint, the contact constraint exactly at that location where we have that imaginary surface. So the displacements uh, or the positions of the, um, uh, at the surface in the soil and at the pile should be equal to it. Uh, now, uh, this creates a little bit of a, of a problem. Imagine that you have a beam element and that beam element, then you have a, a solid element that represents the soil. It is possible that now the surface of the pile is inside that regular element. So the question is how to define that little surface and to assign uh, points uh, to this, uh, um, this uh, imaginary surface where we are going to impose uh, the constraint. But it's possible to do that using some uh, mapping equations. And what happens is at the end, uh, if you use the virtual work principle and you try to impose the uh, constraint, you can follow several different methods. You can uh, use the Lagrange multipliers to impose the, con the constraint, or you can use a penalty method. And when you do that, you end up in the case of the virtual work principle with the constraint enforcement. And then you also have another component here that is added to the internal work that represents the virtual work of the interaction force. Uh, in the penalty method, uh, what you do is to impose uh, the constraint by uh, penalizing the violation of that constraint. And that results also in an additional term that is added to the virtual work. The problem with this is that in general, when you do this to too many points, this is for just one element. Imagine that you have many elements that are near the surface of the pile. You over constrain the system. And when you over constrain the systems, then the results are not good anymore. So better is maybe to use another method that imposes the constraint, but in a weak sense. When you start looking at a weak sense, now you're looking at an integral uh, in, 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 in position of the constraint. And when you do that, you start talking about what is called the mortar elements that relax a little bit the constraint, still imposing them in the general, uh, in the general framework, and the results are uh, much, much better. The last component of this is how to model the nonlinear response at the interaction between the pile and the soil. So we, do we have um, a complete uh, a, a connection between the two points or we allow some displacements and relative movements? When you start allowing some relative movements, uh, what you can do is one solution for this is to make sure that the interaction forces now are related to that relative moving, movement between the soil and the pile. To do that, you have to impose or you have a constitutive relation for the interaction forces. And when you do that, you start adding dissipation. And when you start adding dissipation, then the uh, principle of virtual work will also see a contribution from that dissipation uh, uh, system. The way that we are calculating this relative movement here is to assume that there exists a, a fixed boundary that is hypothetical, that is at a certain distance from the pile where we can define these displacements. And in order to calculate the displacements, we relative displacement, what we do is to define a relative strain. From the relative strain, we can calculate how much is the relative displacement. And of course, we can calculate the relative uh, the interaction force using a relative stress that is defined with the constitution. So this is one of the possible approaches in order to account for that interaction. So let me show you now a, a couple, of, I am nine minutes, I have a, around five more minutes to show you some examples. 
of using this embedded element that has been implemented in OpenSys. So it's already available uh, in OpenSys, this preliminary version that we are testing. So some quasi-static methods. So imagine that you have a pile that is embedded in the ground, and this would be the, uh, the meshing if you try to model this with solid elements for the solid and for the pile, and also an interface relationship between them. Uh, look how complicated it becomes the mesh for this, not only for the pile, but also for the soil. The idea is to replace all that with a regular mesh and a single beam element. When you do that and you apply this lateral load, what we were uh, looking is at displacements of the pile and then uh, using the two approaches and then also looking at um, uh, how is the shear demand and how is the bending demand. Here what you have uh, in blue is the response of this embedded element when you impose it the, in, in a strong form the, the, const the constraint. Now when you use a mortar, you have the red uh, response and then the, uh, the circles represents the response that you would obtain if you model the complete bridge with many elements and also the soil and the interface with both contact. Aircon. So that tells you that the, the, the element seems to be working pretty, pretty well. Now, this is a better one for me, at least, because it's an incline, it's a water pipe. If I had to mesh this using a solid elements, the meshing in particular for the soil becomes quite complicated. So it's much better to have a regular mesh for the soil and then I insert, I embed a beam element there. Uh, here, what I did is to apply also a lateral load, and I've been looking at the responses in terms of displacements uh, for the butter pile. Uh, what we were doing is to consider different uh, angles of butter, uh, 30 degrees, 15 degrees, or the green is zero degrees. We were looking at the displacements, uh, both in the horizontal direction and in the vertical. When the angle is zero, you don't have vertical displacement, you start having vertical displacement when you have different angles. And of course, that has effect on the and the, and the shear demands. The, uh, what we are getting right now is the system seems to be working, seems to be working, and the elements seem to be performing uh, well. And now we extrapolate for a final example uh, to uh, a completely uh, extreme case, it's a dynamic analysis of a pile that is embedded in the ground. And now I wanna take advantage of other things that I have in OpenSys. I wanna use a constitutive model that is for cyclic loss. I wanna include water. So I wanna include liquefaction if possible. All that should be independent of the embedded element and should be independent of the pile. So imagine that you have this soil profile that has a liquefiable component here with different levels of susceptibility. Uh, the, I have an inclination, so I can have lateral spreading, movement of the pile. And then what I have is a massive column that is imposing what is called the free field response to this uh, soil. And of course, I have a motion applied at the base. But let's see what happens when I uh, impose this uh, demand with this slope to a soil that is liquefiable. First, I will show you displacements. So there is not much to see here, but um, let me see. Yeah, you see the pile, you see the interaction points. The pile uh, seems to be following the soil. The soil seems to be moving uh, downward because of uh, this, uh, this excitation. Let me uh, see uh, if you put here the uh, original position of the pile. You see that the pile seems to be moving and actually, what you will see that is maybe it's moving after the strong part of the motion has already happened. So now we don't see much information here. So in order to do a better, uh, a better uh, presentation of this, let's look at now pore water pressures. So now we are going to see exactly the same thing. The colors here represent the pore water pressures. I will have the motion and I will have a point that tells you where in the motion we are. And in this plot, we are going to have a pore water pressure ratio, and then we are going to have displacement, rotation, bending moment, and shear in the pipe. Let's see what happens when this motion happens here. So, um, so let's see if this wants to do it. Oops, no, it doesn't want to do it. Ah, don't tell me, it's, it's, the coolest, it's the coolest thing that I have. Give me one second. It's not showing it. Ah, 
Well, uh, but fortunately, I have the, the results for this. So don't worry about that. Uh, what I wanted to show you is how as the pore water pressure increases, uh, oh, there it is, there it is, look at this. Pore water pressure increases, and uh, look at the pore water pressure ratio, how, how it, it, the motion is almost done here, pore water pressure is still developing. Look at the, this deformation. The motion is almost done, but the deformation seems to be going, continuing. And as they continue, the demands in terms of shear and bending moment continue. So now you will notice that later, it seems that the pore water pressure ratio slows down, but some of the deformation still continues because some part of the soil has not, uh, has not recovered from the liquefaction. So let me show you just a couple of things. At the peak point or second, pore water pressure ratios are not yet equal to one. So I don't have liquefaction, but I have the peak value and the soil is liquefying. Now at eight seconds, it's almost at the end of the strong portion, I have liquefied the soil in a significant portion and the displacements are starting to accumulate. At 40 seconds, which is at the end, I have dissipated pore water pressure. So now the soil is recovering, but the displacements are much larger. And of course the demands are much larger. So this is showing that the effects on the pile are not happening necessarily when you have the strongest part of the motion. They may happen much later when you are accumulating some of it. I think that this type of analysis using this type of uh, embedded elements could help understand a little bit what is happening and maybe model uh, a more, more complex foundation. So concluding remarks, um, uh, one minute over, is that it seems that the conventional formulation um, it, or embedded elements is useful. And the preliminary source seems to be showing that this is working. And the future work includes more validation and verification. We need to do more of this. And we need to start modeling more complex foundation systems, not only one pile, but more of these uh, piles in the system. And uh, try to work a little bit more with this uh, perfect bonding constraint using some relaxation in some constitutive response at the interface. With that, I think that that's uh, all I uh, have. And I think that I, I, I am the bad person because I went over a couple, one, or two, one, one minute or so. Um, so with that, I think that that's the, the, the end of my presentation.